This sermon is titled James chapter 5. Be enriched as you listen. I would like to begin with um, uh, a testimony uh, that has come in and uh, this email came in on the 1st of April. It's a healing testimony and the person who wrote in shares that um, they were watching the online healing service which typically happens on the last Sunday of uh, the month. So they were watching the service and um, uh, the person also had a shoulder impingement syndrome. So uh, they were having pain in their left shoulder uh, for a while and they were taking medication, undergoing physiotherapy, things like that. Uh, but when pastor prayed. A pastor was praying here uh, in the service and they were watching this online and uh, the person decided that they would close their eyes, expect their own healing and at that time a uh, pastor uh, said the words, my body is for God and God is for my body. Uh, so uh, the person also uh, declared that um, uh, verse and prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to heal him. And then, you know, he writes in saying uh, there was a dull aching pain for the following couple of days and then the pain was completely gone. Uh, and the person tried moving their, their shoulder in all different directions and was able to do it with absolutely no pain. Okay, so praise God. We uh, really rejoice that God's power is real and we give glory and honor to uh, the name of our God. Uh, in this morning, church, we will continue in our study of the book of James. Um, uh, and uh, as we know, you know, we are here at James chapter 4 and verse 6 at the central location. So we have um, uh, quite a few scriptures to, to look at in James chapter 4. And then also uh, touch upon James chapter 5. So I'm really praying that God will help us go through all uh, all the scriptures and the Holy Spirit will help us unpack the truth that we need um, to apply in our lives. So to begin with, you know, I just want to uh, quickly go over a few things about the book of James. Now, as we are already aware, James is a half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he, though he grew up with Jesus, he never really believed in Jesus. So he was not a believer uh, until the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, you know, a transformation took place. He uh, believed in the Lord Jesus and he became, went uh, to become one of the leaders of the first century church. And then you know, during his, his uh, time as a leader, he observes different uh, different uh, things going on in the church and to address that he writes the book of James and the book of James is dated back to AD 45 and uh, you know we can clearly see that it is one of the it is the first book you know that was uh, written and so you have many practical instructions in the book of James we um, went on to look at you know all all the uh, three chapters earlier on and we saw that you know James was addressing uh, it, it seems like there are uh, some independent um, insights but he's kind of uh, weaved it all together and all the instruction in there is for practical living and therefore it's helpful for the believers to apply. So in James chapter 1, he talks about trials and he talks about the attitude that a believer must have during trials. And he says, you know, count it all joy when you go through various kinds of trials. You know, that's the last way we would approach our trials. But that's what James says. He says, count it all joy. And then he talks about wisdom, that God is a God of wisdom. When we pray, God is able to give us the wisdom to know what we need to do in our lives. And so he talks a little bit about wisdom. Then he moves on to talk about temptation and how to overcome temptation. And the fact that God is not the author of temptation. And uh, it's really the enemy. And therefore, as believers, we can overcome by the power of God. And, you know, he continues on and, you know, he, he talks about the importance of not just being listeners of the word, but also being doers of the word. In James 2, he um, goes on to emphasize that there are people of different social classes and settings, um, uh, you know, in, in the congregation. But, you no, know, there should be no preferential treatment to the rich uh, against 
those who are poor. And so he says that in God's house, everyone is on level ground and people must be treated equally. Uh, he also goes on to talk about the fact that mercy triumphs over judgment. And then he talks about the importance of acting our faith. Faith is impressive, but what is the point if faith does not translate into action? And so he says, these are the two sides of one coin. We have faith, but we should also have corresponding action. So that is what James 2 speaks of. In James chapter 3, um, he talks about the most important member of our human body, which would be the the tongue, yes, of course, the tongue. And he says that the tongue is a little member, but it has the capacity to steer our lives in a, a certain direction. And he talks about the tongue in the negative context, and he says that, you know, an evil tongue uh, sets the body on fire. But when we see the capacity of the tongue, you know, we understand that, hey, if the tongue is able to bring evil into our lives if we speak the wrong words, how much more goodness can be um, achieved by speaking the right words. And that is why you know, every Sunday we talk about making declarations of God's word. When we speak God's word, you know, that word uh, begins to work and you know, the, the word of God in our tongue becomes a blessing to our body. And he also talks about wisdom and he says heavenly wisdom, it's peaceable, it's pure, it's gentle, uh, it has good fruits and that's the kind of wisdom that one will display when they receive it from God and receive it from heaven. So those are some of the subjects that we are uh, touched upon and now we are in James chapter 4 and last Sunday uh, pastor um, talked about the desires for pleasure, how in the body of Christ or in this particular congregation, it seemed like there were people who were fighting and warring with one another and uh, <coughs> that was really motivated by their evil desires. So, um, and then he says that it's not that we must not enjoy the goodness of God or the uh, pleasures that God has to offer because scriptures do talk about God as a generous God and as a giving God and he is the one who gives us all the blessings so that we can enjoy in our lives but the problem is that we <coughs> tend to ask out of our fleshly desires and which is what makes it problematic. Uh, but then, you know, he says as believers when we have the word of God in our hearts what does the word of God do? The word of God, it's like a hammer. The word of God, it's uh, the double-edged sword. The word of God is the launder soap. The word of God transforms the inner man. And when we are transformed by the word of God, we are able to pray prayers which are in line with the mind of God. And then, you know, our prayers are answered. And that is the manner in which we must approach God, not through our um, the fleshly desires, but through the transformed heart you know, uh, that can only be achieved through the word of God and the spirit of God. So now we will begin fr from verse 6 um, and I will read verse 6. Uh, we generally go through the entire chapter and then you know go verse by verse but since we are already in the middle of chapter 4, I'll just begin with uh, verse 6 and then we'll see how it goes when we come to chapter 5 here. So, uh, he says, but he gives more grace, therefore, he says, God resists the poor, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay? So, uh, in light of what he has already been saying so far, no, he said that we must, not, um, we must not act out of our fleshly desires. That is something that he pointed out. Instead of that, he is instructing the people to receive more grace from God. And you know, it's a wonderful thing for us to know that our God is a God of abundant grace. 
And scriptures also tell us that you know, he sits on the throne of grace. So is there any dearth when it comes to God's grace? No, there isn't any dearth at all. So God is able to give more grace. But who does he give more grace to? The scripture says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Just now, he was talking about being self-willed and you know, coming up with fights and dissensions and divisions and all of those things by being self-willed. But he's saying, please don't be like that. Instead, be humble. And being humble is to be reliant on God. It's to depend on God. Now, being proud would be to depend on ourselves. But being humble is to really depend on God. So, he says that when one depends on God, what happens? God gives more grace to such a person. And just before this, you know, he was talking about, um, um, you know, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now, how can a believer overcome, you know, how can the believer overcome the world? How can the believer overcome trials, temptations by receiving God's grace? And grace is an empowering that God provides. And the more grace I want to receive, the more humble I need to become. And, you know, it's also true that as God begins to raise us up, you know, depending on our calling, depending on our gifting and the assignment that God has for us at various times in our lives. The only way forward is the way down, which is to say, God, I continue to depend on you. No, I continue to rely on you. And as long as we are moving in that manner, what happens? The scripture says, God gives more grace more empowering, more empowering and keeps, you know, taking us forward in our journey. And so that is why it's so important for us to walk with humility because God gives grace to the humble. Now, uh, James also adds a couple of other points that will help us understand how we can humble ourselves. He says, submit to God or be subject to what God says, what God's word says, what the spirit of God is doing. Be subject to that. And he also adds there and says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He adds in, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So a righteous life. A life which is submitted to God is another way in which we can demonstrate our humility before the Lord. And verse 9, he says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. No, it's an attitude of repentance before the Lord where we say, no, God, I recognize. No, I recognize my strengths, but I also recognize my weaknesses. And I do understand that it is only you who gives grace. And so I'm receiving that grace and I know that in due time, you are the God who's going to lift me up. And notice here, you know, he says in verse 10, the last part there, he says, he will lift you up. No, he will lift you up. Our tendency sometimes is to look to people, to look to circumstances and opportunities and think that I'm doing the right thing and I'm sure, you know, somebody will look at this and they will applaud me. But... James asks the believers, focus on the Lord because who is it who can lift us up? It is God himself. So exaltation comes from the Lord and therefore our eyes must be fixed 
on the Lord Jesus Christ. When we humble ourselves, scriptures tell us that it is God who will lift us up. And you know, as Jean was praying this morning, we serve a faithful God and we declare his faithfulness. When we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. Moving on to verse 11 here, James chapter 4. He says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So in these uh, verses, it seems like um, James is forbidding believers from judging other believers. But you know, we look at it in the context in which it is being spoken. Just now, he was talking about the contentions between believers in the body because of their fleshly desires. And in that context, he says, don't judge your brother because there is one who must judge and that is God himself. And when we judge others, what happens is we are taking God's position. Okay, because, um, uh, so that is what he's saying. But based on these verses, the questions that come to our mind are, then is it okay to uh, make honest assessments about people? You know, that would be wrong yeah, if you're just going by these scriptures here. Making honest assessments. And what about uh, administering correction? Maybe you know, some of us are positioned in leadership and we observe that there is a problematic behavior. Then what about bringing correction in situations like this or speaking the truth to people, right? telling things as they are? Because the opposite of that would be flattery where we are so scared to confront people and speak the truth that we want to hide away in the niceness. We say things that we don't mean. No, we say things that are really not the facts. But that would be flattery. So then how do we deal with these verses in James chapter 4? Do not judge your brother. Don't take God's place. No, we have to understand that James is speaking this in the context of the competition which existed in the body of in that particular body and therefore he's not forbidding us from taking the right action but there will be times when we have to make honest assessments we have to uh, talk about the facts we have to um, correct people but the question is what is the motive that we carry in bringing about that correction now, if we sincerely want good for the other person, you know, that's great. And also, uh, the book of Ephesians teaches us that we must always speak the truth in love. And when the truth comes out, but it comes out with harshness, you know, it tends to do a lot of damage. We can speak the truth, but speak the truth in love because then that will build up, edify, bless and direct people in the right way. And this is what we can have in mind when we understand these verses um, in James chapter 4. So we must uh, make honest assessments and avoid flattery. Let's move on. Verse 13 here. And James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So James is 
addressing people who are self-sufficient, self-reliant, you know, have, have enough, and maybe even more. And he's speaking to such people, and he's saying, they're making plans for tomorrow, because they're quite secure, and they know that they want to do certain things, enjoy certain pleasures, so they just look ahead and know that they can handle everything. So for the self-reliant, he says, we don't even know what tomorrow brings. In other words, he's just calling the self-reliant to be dependent on God. And he says, you know, um, instead of making all these grand plans, one ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So again, he's calling people to a, a humble attitude and to not have arrogance, basically. But based on this passage, you know, should we say that, you know, it's not we don't need to have plans, because that's how this sounds. Uh, you know, people are making plans, and James is telling them, no, you say, if God wills, then what about the plans that people make? When we look at this, in the entirety of Scripture, we're not being told that planning is bad. Okay? It, it, he's not um, prescribing an attitude where we say, you know, whatever will be, will be. It's okay. We'll just go about life one day at a time. And also, um, uh, you know, in Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. You know, tomorrow will take care of itself. So, should a believer think about tomorrow and plan for tomorrow? The answer is yes. The Bible does teach us to be, um, uh, you know, prudent and wise in the way we go about the affairs of this life. Uh, in fact, Proverbs 6, you know, it asks us to take a lesson from the ant. What does the ant do? The ant provides for itself or supplies itself in summer and you know, goes to work in uh, winter. So it just collects away so that it is able to sustain not just uh, one ant, but you know, you see colonies of ants. So it asks us to take lessons about planning and being wise about the future. So uh, James concludes you know, in this manner, and he suddenly seems to skip over to a uh, different subject in uh, James chapter 5 here. So we'll move on to James chapter 5. I hope you're all with me. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, seven sections to look at. We've already done three sections. Okay, and you have to brace yourself for us to do four more sections. I'm feeling fine, but I really hope, you know, you're all up to it and you, you'll give me your enthusiasm as we move forward. So uh, let's go ahead with the next section here, which is from James chapter 5. Uh, is it okay if we quickly read through the entire chapter, everybody? And then, you know, you'll be well oriented to what we are speaking about. So you can all read together with me. So we'll just go ahead that way. Let's read the entire chapter together, please. One, two, three, go. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, 
take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth the, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Okay. So thank you for going through that entire chapter. And now we are ready to look at it in four sections. So the first part uh, of James chapter 5 from verses 1 through 6. Now this is where it seems like James is really rebuking the rich now. Okay? And you know it, it comes across very, very clearly. From verse 1 he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. So basically, he's telling them that there is a day of reckoning or that is the day of judgment, which is coming. Uh, who are these rich people that James is talking about? Even earlier on in the passages that we saw, you know, he was talking um, to those who wanted preferential treatment, those who seemed to be exploiting the poor. Okay, so people who are really uh, moving with injustice. And these are the kind of rich people that he's speaking to. And he is letting them know the day of judgment is coming. Or the day of reckoning is coming. And uh, he says, what's going to happen on that day? He says, your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. So basically he's saying all the riches that have been accumulated will be of no use. And even the expensive garments that these rich people own, you know, they will be moth-eaten. And he goes to the extent in verse 3 to say that your gold and silver are corroded. We know, you know scientifically for gold and silver to be oxidized, it's impossible. Uh, but he says even that which is impossible on the day of judgment, you will see these things take place. Why is he rebuking these rich people? Because verse 4 uh, is the most important verse we have to look at here. He says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. So, he's saying that the unjust, exploitative, corrupt, rich person who has not paid the workers fairly, um, may be carrying on with the work and the business as usual, but the cries of such workers has gone to the ears of the Lord. And so you know, we see that God is listening to the cries of the oppressed. And in this case, these are workers who are oppressed. And it's really interesting to note that God is described as the Lord of Sabbath. Okay, the Lord of Sabbath. So it's not the Lord of Sabbath, but the Lord of Sabbath. What does it mean? Now, this title means that our God is the God of the armies. The God of the 
armies. And in other words, we can say that God is a God who avenges the oppressed. Amen? So God is a God who avenges the oppressed. So the cries of the workers have reached his ears and God is getting ready you know, to avenge his oppressed people. And so he really brings a warning to the oppressive um, rich person. Verse 5, he says, You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. So he's saying that, you know, life goes on as usual. The rich continue to enjoy themselves and the, uh, the oppressed over here. Verse 6, you have condemned, you have murdered the just, he does not resist you. And so the oppressed continues to be oppressed and under this heavy weight which is being put on that person. Now, again, you know, whenever we read scriptures like this and we interpret it, uh, these scriptures, you know, just as a one-off thing, we read these scriptures and it sounds like, oh, it's not a nice thing to be rich at all. I Rather, I prefer to be, you know, on the other, in the other camp than to be rich. But that's not what these scriptures are talking about. Because we know that uh, James is referring to uh, the exploitative and unjust rich person. But we also know that it is God who blesses us. And riches uh, and wealth come from God. So there's nothing wrong with uh, being rich or uh, having wealth. It's, it's a very blessed thing. Uh, but how do we steward riches for the glory of God? How do we invest riches for the expansion of God's kingdom? You know, that's a whole new subject that we would need to delve into. But one thing that this uh, section of James is not saying uh, is that, you know, it, it's bad to be rich. No, that's not what this passage is saying. Uh, but, you know, it's just a rebuke to uh, the oppressive rich person. Let's continue now. Now, James switches. He was so far addressing the rich folks and now he's addressing the oppressed folks. So from verse 7, he says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. We'll read verse 8 also. He says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Okay, so he's calling the oppressed and he's, he's recognizing the pain that the oppressed is going through and you know, he, t he lets them know, I know you're going through a difficult time but this is what I want to tell you. He repeats it twice. He says, be patient. Be patient. And that's the way, you know, you, you go forward in these circumstances. Be patient. Why? Why should they be patient? Know that the Lord's coming is near. Now, there is going to be a day when the righteous judge is going to bring everything to account. And uh, he will... You know, he, he will bring out the right judgment and you will, not, uh, you, you will not stand ashamed on that day. And which is why he says, be patient, be patient because uh, the Lord is coming to judge. Um, and, you know, he also brings in the example of a farmer. And what is interesting about a farmer is that a farmer is very active. You know, he sows the seed and uh, for a season, you know, he, he might be busy with other things, but, you know, he's still taking care of the seed that the seeds that he's sown. He's watering them. He's nurturing them in whichever way. He's continuing to be very active and expectant. He knows that at the right time, the harvest time, there's going to be a crop and he's going to have a harvest. And so learning from the farmer means that when we are enduring, and this is a trial, the oppressed are uh, in a trial. And he's telling them, you be patient and endure like the farmer with an expectation in your heart that you've done the right thing and there's coming a day 
when God is going to judge righteously. So carry that expectation with you because there will be a right result or there will be a harvest the way a farmer uh, reaps one. And a side note here, you know, talking about the early and the latter rain, you know, does not directly imply. However, we can understand in the spiritual sense here that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit okay, in, our, in the end times before the Lord comes back, before the return of the Lord Jesus. No, we refer to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as the latter rain. And in Israel, you know, there were two uh, seasons, the sowing season and the reaping season. So during the sowing season, there would be rains to prepare the soil. And then just before harvest, there would be rains to, um, to kind of you know, help with the harvest. Now, when it would rain before the harvest, they would know that it's harvest time and we have to gather. You know, we have to uh, gather all, th all the grains. And in the same way, uh, as this, the Spirit of God is poured out uh, in the body of Christ globally, we can trust and expect God to uh, bring about a great harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. And that is something we look forward to. So coming back to the subject here, you know, he's telling the oppressed, be patient. There is a day coming when you know, there will be righteous judgment. Now, let's move on and see what other instruction he has for the oppressed worker. In verse 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another. Brethren, lest you be condemned, behold, the judge is standing at the door. And you know, this tends to be um, uh, what we, we generally do because it's easy to do to murmur, to complain, to talk about how difficult things are. All of this, but address the issue. Now, how much better it would be to deal with the issue directly than to keep grumbling about it forever. And grumbling, murmuring, complaining, you know, very clearly um, in, in God's perspective, that is not something which he likes. Uh, and we've seen in the Old Testament that there was a people that Moses was leading, uh, grumbling, complaining people. Uh, and, you know, God was furious Okay, with their attitude. And even in the New Testament, we are, uh, we are told that despite going through challenging circumstances, we have to maintain that spirit uh, of steadiness, gentleness, and you know, righteous way of thinking and stay away from grumbling and complaining. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, Paul writes, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. And again, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, he says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, James also adds in these verses, you know, he says that when we complain, now what's happening? Uh, we are um, we don't recognize that the judge is at the door because sometimes in our complaining, you know, maybe it starts off as I'm going through such a hard time and nobody understands and this is too difficult and all that. But you no, know, eventually when we are at it, you know, we could begin to uh, malign others, defame others, discredit others. So. Uh, and when this complaining, murmuring carries on as, you know, discussions with other people, though it's not called gossip, it is a form of gossip. And that is why even Paul, you know, he says, just stay away. Stay away from murmuring, complaining. Uh, if you know what would be the right thing to do to address the issue, you'd rather do that than getting into murmuring and complaining. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't uh, end up doing wrong and it doesn't please God. Verse 11, he uh, talks about the people, the prophets of the Old Testament. He says, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Okay, so here he also asks us to just look at 
examples that can inspire us. And Job is a classic example of a person who went through trial, who went through tribulation, um, and you understand at the end of his journey that God revealed himself as the Redeemer. He revealed himself as the generous God. Because at the end of the book of Job, you know, we read that God blessed him twice. Everything that he had lost, you know, God restored twice to him. But, you know, he endured that trial. He went through uh, the, the difficulties that came his way. So it's an encouragement for us. And especially for these oppressed workers, he says, come on, just endure. Be patient. Don't resort to complaining and murmuring. Look at the examples of people like Job because what do we learn from their lives? Perseverance. Okay, perseverance or endurance that we are able to keep moving forward and trusting uh, in God. And, you know, throughout the book of James, in fact, he uh, paints a completely different picture of how one can go through trials and difficulties. First, he said, count it all joy. I mean, for the world, you know, this, this uh, doesn't sound logical. It's even foolishness. But that's what... Um, James is saying here, he says, count it all joy, persevere, and later on we'll see that he, is, he will ask uh, the believer to pray when they're going through a difficult time. So uh, he brings our attention or draws our attention to Job. Now, there is a phrase there, it says, intended by God, okay, intended by God. And sometimes when we read those lines there, it sounds like God intended for Job to go through pain and difficulty and sickness and all of that. But, you know, we know that that's not what uh, scripture is saying because in the NKJV, it's in italics and that means that the translators have, have put that in there. So it was not there in the original Greek. So uh, we don't interpret this passage to say that God caused Job to suffer. No, God did not cause Job to suffer. It was Satan who caused Job to suffer. Now let's move forward. Now that you know, he's been give, instructing uh, the, the workers on what to do, the last instruction he adds here, he says, do not swear. Okay, do not swear. Now why does he say do not swear? Verse 12, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So he says this because um, in those times, there were very religious Jews who had, um, uh, you know, a way of making the oath. So they would make an oath uh, in, a, in a certain way. When they say it in a certain way, it means that they will keep it 100%. But Another oath, you know, the way they would say it, uh, it was implied that they wouldn't keep it 100%. Okay, so they had all these double standards, even in swearing by, you know, they would take different names. But you know, James understands, he's preaching to a Jewish audience here, and he knows that, you know, they, they, they are familiar with these practices, and he's just letting them know that now that you are in Christ Jesus, there's really no need to swear. Instead, we can just speak sincere words. He's already talked about the power of the tongue and, um, you know, the, the words that are released, how they steer the course of one's life. So he's saying, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. So just simple, honest, sincere heart and the words that come out of that heart should be good enough and there is really no need for for you to swear by anything let your yes be yes and let your no be no even if you're under pressure just keep it simple keep it sincere and honest now let's move on to verse 13 here no, he's continuing. You know, he talked about uh, persevering under trial. So he's continuing um, in, in that uh, same, uh, you know, in, in line with that. Verse 13, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone 
among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And he moves on to uh, verse 16 where he talks about confessing one's fault. So he says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And he takes the example of Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. So in continuation of uh, this encouragement to those who were oppressed, uh, he, he says, okay, come on, you, you can add another thing. Don't complain, don't swear, uh, be patient and all of that. Now, also pray. Okay, pray. Uh, and speak to God. And that's exactly what he said even in James chapter 1. He said, if you lack wisdom, what should we do? Ask God. And God will give it to us. And asking God is prayer. And again, in the situation of trial, he's saying, pray. Is anyone among you suffering? What should he do? Pray. And is anyone cheerful? He says, let him sing psalms. Again, you know, it's basically our expression uh, uh, unto the Lord in any given circumstance. But notice it's all about relating to God. You pray, you sing songs, which is also worship and directed towards God. And in verse 14, he says, if anyone is sick, then what should such a person do? You know, uh, call for the elders and ask them to pray over the sick person. Now, just, you know, uh, sort of going back a little bit and coming back to what James says, if anyone is suffering, pray. Why pray when we are going through a difficult time? How does it help to pray? Uh, we might as well do something and fix the situation. You know, doesn't that sound more um, practical? Why should I take time to pray? Earlier he said, you rejoice. Now he's saying, pray. Because when we pray, what happens? You know, we are waiting upon the Lord. And this, there are, there are many things that happen when we pray. When we pray, scriptures say, they that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. So what is God doing? God releases strength into our inner man. As we wait on the Lord in our difficult times, there is a divine exchange taking place. You know, God's strength is filling up and you know, covering up the weaknesses which we carry within us. And that is why it's so important as we're going through uh, challenging circumstances, maybe the first thing that all of us should think of doing is pray. Hey, let me take a moment. Maybe at our workplace, we may not have a special room to go to, but you could just you know, move away to a corner and say, God, this is what is going on and I'm just calling upon you right now. I'm praying. I don't know what to do. And in those moments, we know that God's strength will be released to us. And not just that. You know, there are many um, outcomes when we engage in prayer. Prayer also is a, a, you know, a, a wonderful way of unburdening our hearts. Uh, what happens in unburdening? You know, we go before the Lord and as the psalmist says, I pour out my heart. You know, we are able to release. You know, maybe we are carrying anger, we are carrying uh, you know, uh, all these complaints. Uh, it's just good to go before the Lord and say, God, you know, all these things are burdening me. I'm anxious, I'm fearful, I'm confused and I'm just pouring out my heart before you. And we know that God releases his peace, his shalom and floods our hearts uh, you know, with, with what only he can do. So when we pray, that is why James is saying, just pray. If you are suffering, pray uh, because you can receive God's strength. You can unburden your hearts. And also uh, in prayer, we know that it's a two-way 
conversation. We cry out to God, but here's God also speaking into our situation. We might receive uh, a prompting from the Lord, you know, or we might uh, um, just remember a scripture verse in that moment, or we might just sense that, hey, I need to get up and I need to go do this or that. So God speaks back to us. He connects back to us and shows us what we need to do. And that is why James said, if you lack wisdom, pray. Just ask God. He will tell you what to do. And you know, through prayer, God can intervene in our lives and in our situation. And prayer is a wonderful way uh, for us to also engage in um, the spiritual realm and release the authority that God has given us. So prayer, prayer is just um, something that, that is going to show us the glory of God in the midst of that challenging situation. And that is why you know, James says, if you are suffering, you pray. Now let's move forward here. Uh, we will go to verse 14, where he says, If anyone is sick, then call for the elders of the church and pray. What exactly happens, you know, if, if this is done? He says, Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So, the focus of this this um, act of the elders praying over a sick person, it's in verse 15, the beginning of verse 15. It says, and the prayer of faith, and the prayer of faith, what will it do? It will, what will it do? It will, yeah, it will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So when somebody is sick, there is an action of faith, which is praying over that person. How does oil help? Oil is just a representation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, that is why we sometimes take oil and we place it over a person and we pray in the name of the Lord. That's what verse 14 says. Verse 15 says, the prayer of faith. It will save the sick. And notice, it says, will save the sick. And God will raise him up. And that is the power of the prayer of faith. When we pray with faith in the name of the Lord. Now, in some situations, maybe you know, there are no elders uh, uh, at, of the congregation present around. It doesn't matter. Pray the prayer of faith. Pray the prayer of faith over the sick. And what God promises is healing um, because of the work of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And that should be our faith and that should be our expectation. And verse 16, you know, he goes on and, and he says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Again, Another way of receiving healing of the heart and sometimes even healing of the body is to confess our sins. Now, confessing our sins, this has to be done with a lot of wisdom. This has to be done with a lot of wisdom. Maybe in certain circumstances, uh, you know, we're carrying this burden. Though we've prayed for forgiveness, we don't sense a release yet. It will help to share it with, uh, a, you know, an, a, a more mature person in the Lord and have them pray for us. And then that should be okay. And you, we will see a freedom and a release when we do that. And there are certain other situations where you know one person might have wronged the other person. So it makes sense to just go to that individual and sort of you know make restitution, confess, and uh, you know pray for one another. And even then, Scriptures promise us that healing comes and God is able to do his work. In verse 7, he goes to the example of Elijah. I'll just call upon the worship team if you could please come and uh, get ready. He talks about Elijah. Now, so far, you know, he has talked about persevering under trial. And uh, he talked about praying and how we should pray. 
and he's going to add to the manner in which one should pray and when we look at the life of elijah and the specific incident when he prayed for rain we realize that uh, you know elijah was a prophet and in first kings 18 the word of the lord came to him so there was a certainty in what he heard god said it is going to rain now if that were to happen to any one of us we'll be like okay my job is done god said it you know i it it's it's um, uh, totally done i don't have to do anything but we see in the life of elijah even after he heard and understood the word of god he goes and announces it to ahab and then what does he do no he goes and he starts praying no scriptures tell us that he put his head between his feet that was the posture uh, that people of uh, his times would take to pray and he earnestly prayed how long did he pray we uh, notice that he prayed up to seven times and he asked you know his helper say go see has the cloud come yet and the helper comes back and says no no not yet nothing yet and elijah puts his head back and says okay i'll i'll just carry on with praying now go see has the cloud appeared seven times and only at the end of those seven times does this helper come back and say yes i can see a cloud as big as you know the the fist of a man and that's when elijah stops praying and you know he runs for his life because he knows that the heavy rains are going to be poured out and so it took a man to pray through the purpose of god was it god's purpose that is going to rain of course god said it but did it rain right away no it didn't god wants us to co labor with him and which is why god was waiting upon elijah to pray through the promise pray through the promise pray through the promise and you know the the point that james is making here he said if you're suffering pray but how to pray pray with perseverance pray with persistence you know sometimes we have the promise of god and we understand what god's word says but as we are praying you know we could come to a place where we get discouraged and say god nothing is happening you said but nothing is happening what am i supposed to do but that's what james is saying here he says elijah was a man with a nature like ours he's simply saying he was a human being just like you and me but what did he do and he prayed how did he pray the term there earnestly or a better way to explain that is with perseverance persistence that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit so god was looking for somebody to stand in the gap and pray without giving up in verse 16 i'm just going to read the amplified version here it says the earnest or in other words heartfelt continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available dynamic in its working and so a persistent prayer life undergirded by it says the prayers of a righteous man undergirded by a life of righteousness it simply says it's going to release power and god's power is dynamic in nature or it brings the energy which is required to intervene in that particular situation and so we must pray but pray with perseverance pray until we see 
something happen. And the last two verses here, verse 19, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And suddenly, you know, there's a change of, uh, he's changed the topic and he's letting the believers know that there is a possibility of um, someone who's following God to even wander away. There is a possibility and that's a warning. And he says, when such a thing happens, you know, we should be there to help people who have wandered away to come back and align themselves to the truth of God's word. And I really believe that though there are bits and pieces, you know, different insights that you know, we've gleaned out of what James has written to his audience, uh, God's word is always timely and God's word is ministering to each one of us in our given situation and circumstance. So we're going to take a few moments to just worship the Lord this morning. Uh, I'll hand this time over to the worship team. Just come back and uh, lead in a time of ministry. We could, all, we could all rise to our feet.
is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Yes, God. Father, we thank you that, Lord, your word says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And this morning, God, that is our confidence. That, Lord, you are a God who is for us. And God, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word which is at work in our hearts, Lord. And Father, we thank you because your word challenges our standards, oh God. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that God, your word unsettles and stretches us because by your word and by your spirit, Father, you are sculpting us. Lord, you are making us, you are molding us, oh God. You are conforming us to the image of your son. And Father, even this morning, Lord, I pray that, God, you would lead each one of us, Lord, in our given circumstances. And Lord, if there are things that the Spirit is leading us to set right, Father, we thank you as we humble ourselves. Your word says he gives more grace. He gives more grace to the humble. And so, God, we receive your grace, O oh God, to realign ourselves. And Father, even as your word calls us, O oh God, to mourn and repent for things that don't honor you. Father, we just come before you and we say, Lord, we bow down before you, God. Change us, God. Help us, God. Be gracious to us, O God. And Father, we thank you that, Lord, you are pleased by our heart that is willing to realign to the standards of your word. And Father, this morning we pray for anyone who's saying that I am suffering. Yes, I am suffering. I am oppressed. I'm going through a trial. I am afflicted. Father, we pray for the word, O oh God, to comfort, to bind up, to strengthen. And Father, we ask for your wisdom. Father, we ask for your wisdom in these circumstances. And Lord, we ask for your grace to endure knowing that we have a God who restores, He redeems. Thank you, God. Thank you that, Lord, none of our losses are losses when we place it at your feet. That, God, you are the one who gives beauty for ashes the oil of gladness for mourning, O oh God. Father, you make us oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. And so this morning, God, we just surrender ourselves to you and we say, Lord, reveal your glory and your purpose in the circumstances where we find ourselves, O oh God. And this morning, God, we also pray that, Lord, you will release upon every heart and every life, Lord, a burden to pray. And hold on to the word of God unceasingly to persevere, to be earnest, and be effective in our prayers, releasing the power of God in every situation. 
thank you god thank you for the power of prayer god thank you that your as your children we can release the authority of the kingdom through our prayers and god that you are accomplishing mighty things for your name's sake as we pray thank you god thank you for what you are doing in our midst and this morning church we're also going to pray for those who are sick in the in your physical bodies i just want you to lay your hands on yourself i know we're still wearing masks and maintaining social distance so i'm not going to ask others to come and lay hands on you but you can lay your hands on yourself because that's what the word of god says you know if you're sick you pray the prayer of faith and here we are all of us and we're going to pray the prayer of faith and we saw that scripture it says and god will save god will raise him up and so we're going to just join our hearts together and release that faith over sick bodies this morning so please go ahead just you know uh, touch yourself where you want healing with those watching online you could do the same thing uh, and even if you're not able to do that for whatever reason don't worry just believe just believe this morning and father we thank you that lord you have carried our sorrows our griefs oh god the chastisement for our peace was upon you and god we thank you that by your stripes we were healed we were healed and so god in the name of jesus i speak healing to sicknesses to conditions in people's bodies right now i speak healing to growths in the back area i speak healing to the ear i command healing to those who are struggling to stand up struggling to stand up command healing in that situation i speak strength to people's feet right now in jesus mighty name thank you god thank you for your word is true god even as we pray in the name of our savior jesus the prayer of faith knowing that you have taken it all on the cross of calvary thank you for your healing which is made manifest in our bodies right now lord we give you thanks we give you praise jesus just for a brief moment i want to ask if there's anyone um, you're instantly feeling better if you could testify to that just raise your hand indicate that would be excellent and i know some healings take a while you need to check it out that's okay but if there's anybody you say hey i can feel the difference it'll be nice if you could share man praise god So you could let us know maybe you want to check it out you can email us and let us know what the lord has done for us I just want to go ahead and pray one more prayer so uh, let's pray together heavenly father i just pray right now for the breaking of every yoke lord for the breaking of bondages over people's lives in the name of jesus every op- spirit of oppression i take authority over you in jesus mighty name i i cancel your work 
over your children over God's people and I release God's liberty because the word of God says whom the sun sets free they are free indeed the spirit of God is a spirit of liberty we declare that Father we ask for the working of miracles in people's lives that God there will be breakthroughs and Lord that your mighty power will be seen O oh God for the glory of your name Lord we just thank you we thank you for what you're doing right now Lord we give you praise and glory thank you Jesus and I also just want to ask anyone if you've never um, acknowledged the Lord Jesus as you know God the Son of God uh, and that you didn't know that he's the one who has come to forgive your sins to cleanse you from every unrighteousness and make you a child of God now, today I just want to give you an invitation I want to let you know that the Word of God says that God loves you right while we were still sinners Christ Jesus died for us Romans 5 8 and that's the kind of love with which Jesus loves you and this morning you can just go ahead and pray a prayer together with me and uh, we know that scripture says when we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus we are saved and we become children of God so I just encourage you to pray together with me just repeat after me dear Lord Jesus thank you for dying on the cross for my sins forgive me I give my life to you Lord thank you for making me a child of God and help me to live for you from this day forward in Jesus name Amen man and if you have prayed this prayer then you know we would like to um, uh, get in touch with you we have some resources uh, that we would like to give you so please uh, do let us know maybe you can put it on the chat if you're uh, viewing online or you can just come uh, meet us here uh, uh, right now near the stage area I will be happy to meet with you uh, uh, some pastors will be here to pray as well so uh, anyone who needs prayer please do come forward and um, you know meet with us uh, we will get ready and close this morning service uh, let's just pray one last time Heavenly Father we thank you for your presence in our midst oh God and Father we thank you for the word Lord which you have spoken into our lives this morning Father we pray that uh, Lord day to day Lord that we will keep moving forward with you Lord Jesus thank you Abba we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus name we pray Amen and may the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.